All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the public Q&A call. Great to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining me. And if you didn't hear what happened uh, with my first call today, this morning, the first public Q&A call uh, today, um, it was Zoom bombed. So I wanna just share with you what that means. Um, Zoom bombing is when people um, take over, uh, yeah, people who aren't meant to be there, spammers, hackers, trolls, really, um, jump into the call and um, show pornographic images, uh, racist or hateful uh, chats, and things like that. And the porn wasn't even good. <laughs> I, I was laughing, I'm like, this is the most worst porn I've ever seen in my life. It's just gross, it wasn't even, wasn't even uh, but that's the point. They're, they're trying to uh, offend. They're trying to um, you know, destroy a, a meeting. Um, you know, I, I don't have any enemies. It's just that, not that I know of. I'm sure some people don't like me calling out some <laughs> inauthentic marketing practices, but it, this wasn't them. This was just probably teenage boys who know how to Zoom bomb. They probably look for you know, they go on Facebook and, or, or any social media and search public Zoom, and then they find links, and then they go and then do their thing, right? Um, it was traumatic for me, uh, for sure. I, I'm glad that when it f first happened, I was, um, you know, my first reaction, thankfully, was, 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 was actually one of curiosity. I was like, how? How are they doing that? That's so fascinating. Like, I thought I had control of the meeting, but how are they doing this and this? And so they taught me a few things. Uh, the silver lining is um, like, oh, I didn't know Zoom, even then when you turn off the screen sharing for participants, they can still share sound, um, not unmuting, but sharing their iPad sound. Oh, okay, well, now I know. So, um, uh, you know, there, there was somebody here who, um, uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll just go ahead and share what I what I what I see as the uh, really the only solution um, that I can think of at this point. And uh, give me a second here. Um, okay, so really the only solution, and Liz asked Liz asked us. She's she's not here right now, but she can watch this later. Um, you know, when you when you Google how to prevent Zoom bombing, right? Typical advice: uh, oh, turn off ability for for people to screen share, uh, don't don't let people unmute. You know, which I understand. Obviously, you, you know this. These are not for the trolls. These are for people who accidentally do these things, um, but with good intention. With good intention, you know what I mean. Like like I have some clients, students who are not as tech savvy and. And maybe they accidentally share their screen and they're, oh, I'm sorry, you know, that's not, that's, then you turn off the ability to screen share. That makes sense. But people who, you know, the, the, then you have to turn off screen sharing, you have to turn off annotations, you have to turn off uh, ability for them to speak, and then you have to turn off the chat because the chat was filled with racism um, and, and they renamed themselves. They actually, re anyway, it's like, what, if you're not going to let them chat, screen share, or, do, or speak, you might as well do a Facebook live video. It might as well be one way, not, not an interaction. If you, if you don't let them show their video also, which I'm grateful those of you who are here, I'm able to see you on video. I might as well just be doing a video for you. Why am I even, why are you even here, right? So, so really the, the only um, solution that makes sense to me is just be careful who has access to the Zoom link. Well, people go, well, what about the Zoom password? Hey, listen, this, the Zoom password is the same thing. If, if I give you the Zoom link and the Zoom password and then you share the Zoom link and the Zoom password, what's the point? There's no point in being password protecting it. That's the same thing. So you only, you only need to be careful who has access to the access information, which means, right, don't post the Zoom link anywhere publicly. Okay, number one, not on a Facebook event page or, 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 or anywhere public. It's okay to do this in, um, you know, fine to do it in small private groups where you know everyone, okay? And that, of course, that, that's fine. I, I, I have done, I've been doing Zoom meetings for years um, and every week I do 
I can't, 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 I mean, I do probably two or three Zoom meetings a day um, with the same Zoom link forever. And so if someone, the people have this idea that, ooh, Zoom is not secure because anyone can find, no, nobody can find your Zoom link. Zoom links, the, the Zoom link is very complicated set of numbers. Nobody can, oh yeah, but they have software now that can guess Zoom numbers. Baloney, I'm, no, one, not, no one I know is, I haven't heard of people really actively using that software to like, well, let me check every single Zoom meeting. That's ridiculous. So, so the reality is that if you, as long as the Zoom meeting link is private to just to the people who, who are meant to have it, and then you tell people, please don't share the Zoom link, and because for security purposes, spammers can get in, that's all you have to say. That, and, and, and so a couple things. One is if you are doing, and I'll, I'll write this down as well in the, in the, um, in the live chat. Okay, so basically, so basically, um, if if it's a free event, anyone can register. Okay, then just close registration right, thirty to sixty minutes before the meeting, and plan for yourself to be uh, sending out the Zoom link thirty to sixty minutes before. That's it. Um, you know, mass email, obviously. For, for ease, right? So, so that's, how, that's the simplest solution, right? Just say, hey, listen, uh, you, can, you can sign up for the Zoom up to one hour and, and for everyone who signs up, right? Like, um, make sure sign up confirmation says, check, you know, check, check your email um, uh, 30 minutes before for, for the Zoom link. That's all you have to say. Do you see what I mean? That's the simplest solution. And then you just, you, and then, um, and you have questions in your registration that vet people, that vet people, um, open-ended question. A simple open-ended question is enough, right? Um, uh, related to your topic, to your topic. So um, what question do you have about authentic business? No spammer or troll is gonna like do the work to figure out, well, how do I ask a good question here? Or, or another question is, um, say how you discovered me. Well, maybe people will say, well, from a friend. That's, that's not helpful. So, so I think it's probably better to have some question that, or uh, for security, um, yeah, I was going to say, ask people to share their Facebook profile link for you to look at. But, you know, this is the most realistic and simple way of going about it. Just like ask them a question. If you're teaching Reiki, you know, hey, what question do you have about Reiki? And people are, you know, and then you only accept the people who have, who have a thoughtful question and you send the link, Zoom link to them. If someone is asking a question that seems suspect, then it's okay. You don't send a Zoom link to them. And, and you might want to say, um, you know, uh, the Zoom link will be sent to, to people who asked a question, you know, something like that. Or, or un unless you know them, sometimes people register, oh yeah, I know Jeffrey. Yeah, that's fine. You know, I'm just gonna let them in. You know, that's fine. But it's only for the people who who you don't know, like you never heard of their name, or you never you don't you don't you know they're not on your email list, or if you were familiar with your email list or whatever, then you go okay, ask ask a question, right, like that. So um, there there was there was there was uh, there there were uh, you know a few people who registered for this who who didn't ask a question. So then of course that got me nervous. So I emailed them individually to say, hey, you know, I'm vetting people because you know I, I don't know. I don't know you and I'm not familiar with your name. If you don't give me a last name, especially. And, you know, I, so what I do is I, I quickly search that person's name in my email to see if they've registered for my email list or whatever. If I can't find their name, then, then I, I vet them, you know? So, so it's, it's really, a, to me, that's the simplest solution. And then the other solution, of course, besides doing all this for, for the free stuff is um, make it a paid event. Okay no troll is going to pay to spam your event. Okay. <laughs> All right. No, um, especially if, especially if it's, if it's more than a few bucks, right? Now, if it's like, if it's like a major event where there's going to be hundreds of people, there might be a troll who's like, oh, I don't mind spending $10 for the thrill of Zoom bombing an event. But, but you could, if you, if, if you, even if you were doing a $10 event, uh, that's going to be lots and lots of people. You could say, "Hey, listen, uh, the event is is fifty dollars, but I'm going to refund you forty um, after you come to the event and fill out the feedback form." And so you just basically mass 
pay mass pay on PayPal, mass pay, uh, just put a quick spreadsheet together with the email list of everyone paid for the event, mass pay them 40. That's it. Everyone gets $40 back. You know, it's as simple as that, or everyone who filled the feedback form, whatever. Um, so, 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 but long story short, I have never had Zoom bombing happen in any of my paid courses. Uh, my paid courses are usually at least $50 and, and up. So, you know, I don't know what the threshold, I, I, I don't, I doubt that anyone's going to pay $10 in Zoom bombing event. So even if your thing was $10 or $20, it's probably going to be the simplest filter. And, and you just share the link with everyone who paid for the thing. And just hey, please don't uh, share this anywhere else. So that's the simplest way is to do a paid event. Otherwise, for the free thing, you just have to do a little bit of vetting for the registration form, and that's it. So uh, don't worry about the Zoom thing. Zoom is not. See, look, this one, this this event right now. Well, it's still ten minutes in. We'll see if anyone Zoom bombs is probably not. But you see what I mean? I vetted all of you, so only the those of you who are here have the link, and you're not going to share it everywhere else. So. So anyway, that's the simplest solution. Anyway, um, welcome everybody for uh, for uh, to the event. I, I'm I'm still recovering from this morning's <laughs> traumatic experience. It was uh, it was you know like I said, my first reaction was one of curiosity. How are they doing it? Blah blah blah. Um, but then I was got really concerned about the triggering images for my attendees, and of course my third concern was well, my my reputation. Obviously, this is being Facebook live stream and everything. Um, and then after I got off the call, then it, then it hit me like this feeling of being raped, like this feeling of being terrorized and, and sort of, um, violated, uh, you know, it's like, that was my event. I was in control, but no, I'm not in control. A group of trolls came in and, and did all that. So I was like, Oh my, what if I hack? what if they hack my website? Are they after me? No, it's, it's all irrational fear. Of course, after rationally, <laughs> after an event like that, there are these irrational fears. Um, but nobody cares. I mean, these Zoom trolls are just going from Zoom event to Zoom event. They're not trying to like hunt you down or anything like that. There's, there's no one wants to do all that work. The Zoom trolls are just having fun. They're teenage boys. They think that's fun, you know. And I remember as a teenage kid, I'm sure I did some disruptive stuff. That you know, um, these days it's called Zoom bombing. You know, back then I don't know what I did, but uh, so um, anyway, thanks for those of you who happen to. Uh, go through that experience with me i apologize for you know uh for for what happened and uh, hopefully we all learned from that and we can all um have better zoom meetings going forward so um i know at least one of you was was there this morning so uh thanks for thanks for bearing with us to uh, stay bearing with me through that so anyway let's keep going here um on the questions um Okay, so I'm gonna first uh, take the questions from those who are here live, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go into the questions from those who sent but can't be here live. And uh, I see Sean is here. I was trying to take a question this morning, but that was, that was uh, once the Zoom bombing happened, I had to stop the meeting, so I couldn't take a question. So here we go. Um, Sean says, which tasks and projects do you outsource on a regular basis? And uh, basically these. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't do graphic design. Uh, well, I do. I, I actually do graphic design. Very amateur for my personal private client stuff, but not for the public stuff. So like if I want to do, you know, a book cover, obviously, you know, book, book, book cover, you know, audio book cover. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I even do the own graphic design for my own course cover images because they're so basic. They're, there's really nothing there. So, so any, anything like that. Audio editing uh, for pro professional audio editing, I, I really should say. Well, yeah, um, yeah, professional audio editing. I could do my own really, really basic trim this, trim that kind of thing, but professional ones um, that I do. Uh, if I needed to trim videos um, uh, a lot, uh, like, you know, okay, I gotta, I gotta trim, do 20, 20 edits on this video, uh, I, might, I might, you know, outsource that to say, all right, trim from here to here. Well, if I knew time timestamps, oh, okay, if I need to trim videos a lot and have transitions between the trims, um, then, then, then I would outsource it. <laughs> Otherwise, if it's just trimming a few things, front and back, and maybe this middle section, I can do that on, on, on QuickTime. You know, it's super, super easy to do that. Um, researching potential collaborators to reach out to uh, is very time intensive, but it's very important work. So, um, uh, now that I have a, an affiliate program, I don't, I'm kind of taking that off for a while, but 
uh, this is something that I have definitely outsourced. Um, collaborators, meaning uh, people who could promote my courses and my, you know, my, my programs, things like that. Um, let's see, uh, if, if needed, also uh, the outreach. You know, I, I, pr I, I pr prefer personally to you know, send, um, uh, send the outreach myself personally, but if I'm reaching out to you know, 50 people or something or 100 people, then I might, I might get a very thoughtful VA uh, to do the outreach. You know, that, that would you know, say, hey, listen, um, go ahead and do this. If you can mention something about their website that you really appreciate, you might want to say that. And otherwise, here is a template kind of thing. So I hope that helps. Okay. All right. Uh, let's keep going here. Just going down a list of people who are here. Um, uh, let's see here. Give me just a moment. Um, okay, cool. Great, Donna. Okay. Oh, Denise, yes, I, we're, we're going to get to you as well for sure. Okay, so can you recommend a step by step startup checklist? I thought having a website platform as a hub of operations would be first, but I've read that you don't agree. Uh, also, why do you not recommend WordPress when everyone else seems to? Yeah, great, great question. So, why not website first? Um, I recently wrote my uh, bit of a rant blog post about that, and I just wanted to make sure I give you the link to that, for those who didn't read that blog post. Um, uh, and in fact, I do mention the first steps here, so that might, that might kind of solve the problem, but um, I just, uh, why not website first? Okay, so that's, that's, that's why, why not? Basically, uh, you, it's really, um, you get clarity about your business, about your niche, about your message by doing, uh, doing the work of market research and actually talking to enough, working with enough clients. Uh, that's really after that is when the website should happen uh, and not before. Anyway, re read that blog post for more. Um, and business startup checklist step step by step. Here it is, you know, right right here. Really, I my got my five steps here. So um, you know, if you have any questions about these five steps, let me know, and we can go go into this more deeply. But I just you know, since it's here, I just wanted to show it to you. And um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, oh, and why not WordPress? Um, why not WordPress? You know, people who there's a there's a very uh, passionate uh, contingent of WordPress users. Uh, and whenever I talk about this, I, I can offend people who absolutely just love WordPress and think everyone should use WordPress. So I'll just say that, um, you know, it hasn't been easy for me, right? It hasn't been easy. I don't want to do the maintenance. Uh, even though I'm probably tech savvy enough, I don't want to have to have to use my time to do the maintenance. Yes, George, you can outsource the maintenance. Well, then you go. That's another, that's another cost. Why not outsource the maintenance to, right, Wix, right, Wix, Strikingly. Those are probably the two that I would go with if I were um, Kajabi, uh, if, if a uh, serious course seller and, and don't mind paying um, 150 a month for your website and course platform, then I would go with Kajabi. Otherwise, these are much cheaper, Wix or Strikingly, and there's much, they're much easier. Right now, I'm using Weebly. Uh, I wouldn't recommend going there because they, haven't, they have not updated their platform for years, and I'm just too lazy right now to switch. So there it is. And also, um, maintenance and security upkeep, because WordPress has a lot of security issues ongoingly, and you have to and plug in compatibility and you know, stability and all that other stuff that, that like, you, you end up, you know, having a little bit of a part-time job, not, not, maybe not, maybe not that extreme, but, but yeah. And it's also hard to make it also, um, well, it's with themes these days, it's not that hard to make it look good, but Wix and Strikingly are essentially like, well, they do all the maintenance. They do all the security upkeep. <laughs> they do all the plug-in compatibility and millions of mil tens of millions of people use these websites and they're happy with them. So why don't we use them? Well, but WordPress has all these functionalities. Well, yeah, but realistically, are you going to use them? If you, if you get so sophisticated one day that you end up using some advanced functionality is essential for your business, you will have enough money by that point to switch over to WordPress if you want to. Listen, I, I have a successful business. I have a 
have had six figure business for 10 years now, sophisticated, you have lots of courses out there being for sale. I have, it's a pretty sophisticated, well, sophisticated solopreneur business, right? I haven't needed anything WordPress does, even at the stage. So what's the point? I'm successful in an industry that's extremely competitive. People who are looking at my website, judging my website all day long because I'm supposed to be, you know, a marketing guy. And yet my WordPress, my, my website is on the simplest platform, the most, you know, that simple platform that hasn't even innovated itself in years. And I, my business has gone up every year, uh, ever since I rebooted my business and I kind of restarted again. It's gone up every year since 2016. Even this year, during a pandemic year, it's higher than last year. So, um, yeah, I don't think this WordPress thing is, is, is necessary. Again, if, you're, if you love messing with that stuff, go for it. If you, if you enjoy it, go for it. <laughs> no problem, right? It's just for those of us who don't want to mess with it. Right? Do you think writing a book is a good initial way of introducing your business to the world, or would a blog be better? Blog, hands down. <laughs> um, for SEO, for shareability. Um, and after you write a bunch of blog posts, turn them into a book. It's, that's, that's what I did. I've had four, I have four books now, right? So yeah, that's, that's my rec recommendation. And yes, of course, launch a book. But after you've already gotten the benefit of getting your stuff out there for a year, year and a half, two years, however long it takes you to write enough where you feel like, all right, I think I've gotten enough for a book here. But the whole time. You are marketing yourself instead of, all right, let me sit down for three months and write a book and then get it out there. The problem is this, right? When you sit down at once and write a book, right? Um, those who write books without blogging um, them out first, missing out on precious opportunity for market research, right? Market research um, questions, uh, that further your, your, your material and all that op opportunity cost of marketing. I mean, that marketing <laughs> in, in those months, years, right? Why, why not, right? Uh, audience marketing slash audience buildup, right? Audience buildup in those months, years. So I hope that helps. And um, all right, let's keep going here. And if you have any questions, by the way, uh, that are follow on to this. Um, we are a small group here in the Zoom meeting, so you can just unmute if you want to kind of follow up with anything I'm saying. Just interrupt me because otherwise I just keep talking. <laughs> so if you have anything, just interrupt me. Feel free. So, oh, George, can I ask something? That's totally fine. Or, or, or add a chat in there and I'll, I'll try to glance at the chat. So, uh, okay, how can I get myself to be consistent and methodical about my business? Despite my goal of having a business, I approach it in fits and starts. I realize I hate the word business, maybe it's subconscious. Yeah, that, that could be, right? You know, call it, call it your true livelihood or, or whatever you wanna call it um, to make it uh, more interesting. This is my, well, this is why I call it my authentic business, right? Because that, that excites me much more. Um, you can call it my, you know, my calling, right? Or, you know, my, um, uh, you know, my, my ministry really. Right. So, so any, use anything that, but in terms of, uh, productivity, so essentially you're asking a question that is one of my favorite topics, which is joyful productivity, right? Joyful productivity, one of my favorite topics. And, um, I have an entire course on that. I just want to show you real quick. I'm not trying to sell it, but just in case you want to follow up on that more, um, the link is georgecow.com slash time. Very simple mindful time management. I basically give you dozens of my, my own practices. Uh, that's, I think it's two, maybe 20 to 30 of my own practices, something like that. Um, uh, if you want to go deeper, but let me just give you some of the things that kind of come to mind for me right now uh, about, about being consistent and methodical, because that's one of the questions I get uh, most often. Um, consistent, methodical, you know, for, for me, it comes down to following a set schedule, right? Now, we've all heard that for so many years. The question is, well, how do you follow a set schedule? I don't feel like it. The, the, the time comes for me to do, you write my blog post that it says that on my schedule, but I don't feel like it, right? And so uh, how to deal with 
I don't feel like doing this right now, right? I need to be inspired before I do it, right? So how do you do it? Okay, one tool, I'm just being very practical here, right? Focusmate.com. I use it multiple times a day. I literally use it three, usually about three hours a day. I'm on Focusmate. And it helps me to, I tell my Focusmate partner, hey, listen, I don't feel like writing my blog post right now, but that's what on my schedule. It's on my schedule. And I know, and also, um, as you do what you plan, even when you don't feel like it, and you feel proud afterwards, right? That is a signal you are following your purpose uh, in stretching yourself, um, right? So it's, it's the practice of uh, going beyond comfort zone again and again that stretches, you know, that enlarges comfort zone. So in other words, I used to, you know, I said this in before in blog posts of the past, I have had pretty much writer's block most of my life, um, in part because we immigrated to this country when I was seven years old. And I was, first of all, I was the third kid. I was the youngest kid in my house, always told to be quiet, just listen to, to, to the adults. My, my two brothers are much old. Well, they're, they're, they're close in age, but they're, they're both much older than me. And so I was always told to be quiet because I, I didn't know what I was talking about. So be quiet, don't, don't talk, just listen, right? So I got trained in that early on. And then we, we moved to a country where I didn't know the language. As a young kid in elementary school where it was easy to get you know, laughed at, ridiculed, bullied for being quiet. Okay, and the quietness, I'm sure, also has something to do with my Asian culture or tradition or whatever compared to, you know, the kids that grew up here, right, in the more, much more individualistic and gung-ho America, you know. So all, all those factors made me a bad communicator uh, most of my life. I couldn't, I couldn't, I hated writing and speaking also was fits and starts and was, so... I had to do a lot of practicing, you know, um, speaking, thankfully, the practicing was a little bit easier because I was nurtured by, you know, helpful teachers and things like that throughout high school and, and college. So that was a bit better. But writing, I still hated, of course, with the trauma of college, you know, <laughs> writing papers uh, all night long, you know, it's terrible. I, had, I was an English major. So it's like I got tons of papers. Long story short, by writing every day for a hundred days and publishing my writing for a hundred days. Now I took off the weekends, but Monday through Friday, and I, I could only do it by start, by, by, by doing it on my phone, because then I didn't see the blank large screen on my computer, that freaked me out. So the, the blank screen on my phone was less freaky because I was also used to texting friends or writing emails on here. So I'm just much more comfortable on my phone. So I, I, I always, I, I felt, feel like whatever you need to do, start, see if you, see if there's a place where you do that kind of thing that's more comfortable for you. For me, the hard part was writing. So, so I had to do, find, okay, where do I write that is more comfortable? Oh yeah, my phone. So let me start writing my phone and give myself the deadline that every day you got to write and publish, even if it's 10 words, you know, even if it's bullet points, you're going to write and publish. You don't have to be an eloquent, you know, novel writer kind of thing. So anyway, um, and, and, by, and by continually uh, practicing, stretching myself a little bit, a little bit, a little bit every day, just like muscles, just like exercise, now we have the ability to, you know, run one mile when we couldn't before. How is that possible? It's the same body. Well, it's not the same body, right? Your body has changed. And it's the same psyche. How can I write so much now where it's not the same psyche? My psyche has changed. So it's, it's really, um, yeah. And also talk about practice. Also the practice of following our schedule day after day makes following the schedule easier over time. It just gets easier. But if we practice the opposite, if we practice the opposite, it's on my schedule but I don't feel like doing it, then we're practicing that. And that gets easier also, right? And, and telling, uh, you know, um, 
you know, and, and, you know, I've had clients in the past who, yeah, I think of a client who was like a high performing person in his, in, in, in their field. And they paid me a lot. And week after week, we just come back and they didn't do their, their work. And to be honest, I realized at this point that I'm not a good coach in that way. Like, I, I am not a good coach in holding your feet to the fire. I am more of a consultant. You come to me with your questions. Let's solve it. Let's figure out a way. But you got to do it. I'm not going to, like, text you every day kind of thing, right? So that person and I practiced them not doing it. So it got easier and easier over time for them not following through. And I practiced not holding their feet to the fire. So I got better at not holding it. So see, it's like everything, we, we, it, but that's our, ourselves too, because you are your most important client. You are your most important client. So how you treat yourself as a client, are you holding, your, your, you know, holding yourself lovingly to the, to the fire of love, you know? <laughs> to, to the fire, you know what, it's okay. I know it's scary but you don't have to write a blog post. You just write 10 words. Can you do write 10? Just write whatever comes to you and then massage it for the next 30 minutes. That's it. And then just post it. And oh, you're too scared to post it publicly? It's okay. Let's post it to our three friends who are supportive. Let's post it to this private group that we know we feel safe in. That's it. So we're all just practicing, practicing, practicing safe places, safe places, a little bit less safe, but we're practicing there. You know. But it's really personal growth, right? And professional development. It's about... How do we artfully and gracefully experience the uncomfortable, right? And it's okay to be uncomfortable. And that's one of the lessons that I learned just this year. It's taken me all my life to get to this point. Oh my God, no one ever told me. No one ever told me, or maybe no, no one has reminded me in too long. It's okay to be uncomfortable. Like whatever it is, I feel shame. It's okay to feel shame. Don't, don't, don't eat your way out of it or don't, don't you know, anger your way out of it. Don't resent your way out of it. It's okay to feel shame. It's okay to feel like I just did something. It's okay to feel guilty. It's okay to feel like I'm procrastinating, but I'm gonna, it's okay to feel weak. It's okay to feel whatever. Everything is okay. I don't have to eat my way out of it. Right? I don't have to you know, you know, blow up at somebody uh, to, to get my way out of that feel. Anyway. That's my biggest lesson this year. And I think it's going to, it's a life changing lesson. Look, oh, I feel, I feel shame right now. Oh, I feel blame. I feel self blame. Oh, that's, a, that's okay to feel that. Oh, how interesting. What, what's, I know there's a gift here. I can't figure it out right now, but I know one day I'm going to be looking back and go, wow, now I get it. Now I get why that was such a valuable experience. I don't get it right now, but I know it's coming. I know it's coming. It could be tomorrow, actually, or it could be my life review. I don't know when, but I'm going to find this moment to be so valuable. So, Thank you for this experience. And then um, thank you for this valuable experience. And then what can I do? Uh, what's, what's useful that I can do right now? I don't have to figure this out right now. I don't, I don't have to get rid of my shame right now or get rid of my anger or get rid of my fear. Get rid of my, I don't have to do that right now. But what's the productive thing that I can do next that I know how to do that is something that's useful in my day? That's all. So that's how I've been moving through uncomfortable feelings. And it's been so, so helpful. And it's made me stronger. Like, oh, I can feel that. Like this morning, Oh, I can feel the fear of people attacking me. I can feel the, the sort of the, 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 the trauma. I can feel that. I can feel that. And one day, and I'm grateful for that feeling because now I can relate to people better, right? I, can't, I don't have to figure this out right now. I can be, I can be low energy today. I, can be, I don't have to be high energy. It's okay. Just let it ride out. It's okay. However I'm feeling. Anyway, so I just wanted to share that very, very personal, uh, profound lesson for me that's been... Right. So... What would you recommend as an accountability support method group or partner? Yeah. So, you know, you didn't know I was going to say it, but yes, I'm going to say focus mate again. Um, highly recommend it. And if you, uh, if you use focus mate and you find that you want to keep using it, um, let me know because email me because you can join my focus mate group. My focus mate group means that you get to work with me and people in my group more often. And those of you who are watching this and be, you know, it's wonderful people. So, uh, so try that. Try Focus. Focus Made is free. If you do three sessions a week, if you do more than three sessions, it's just five dollars. Five dollars a month. Do unlimited sessions. It's very, very affordable for for the kind of profound impact that's been having with people. Um, I've been viewing your startup videos today, which I find address many of the above issues. In the trying it out phase, where I just write to see where it's going, I'm inclined to include links to direct my readers to relevant sources, even though I. 
haven't developed a whole affiliate marketing setup. What do you think of doing this? Um, okay, I'm trying to include links to direct marketing development source. Right. Uh, yeah. Um, you know, let go of needing to get affiliate links. You know, the truth about affiliate marketing is that you won't. Uh, you only make money by doing bigger deals. Um, the small money deals are not worth your headache, right? Or anxiety for not, not being able to find a link. Right. So, so that's what I've learned honestly about, about affiliate marketing. Now, George is like, you might say, well, George, don't you have an affiliate program that has 160 people in it? Yes, I do. And I probably shouldn't have added so many people so quickly, but I just wanted to say, Oh my gosh, I want to support. I want to thank all these people. The way my affiliate program works is that, um, Basically, it, people come into my affiliate program, people who are you know, students and clients and you know, big supporters, as long as they share one of my courses that month, I will put them into the uh, share pool of 15% of my total course income. My total course income a month, I take 15% and I just divide it all up into all the people who shared something that month. So I just, yeah, it's, it'll be small dollars if there's a lot of people. But you know, I just wanted to thank everyone just a little bit. Uh, but you know, it's to really make money with affiliate marketing. And I don't know if I'm answering the right question or not, actually. Um, hi, Donna. Hi, actually, I wasn't thinking of making money at this point because I'm not a real person, actually. I was just, you know, typing and as you suggested, trying things out in mm -hmm. writing. But a lot of the things that I want to suggest, I know of resources that would be helpful to the readers. So I thought yes. it would be handy to put a link in there. I mean, I really wouldn't be, I wouldn't be getting any money, but I wondered if I would be wasting that opportunity by using it now instead of later on yeah. when yeah. I'm a real affiliate yeah. person or something. Totally. I appreciate you asking that. Yeah. So no, this, this is, this is good. I, oh, well, I don't even have to share my screen for this. I just want to share, share with you. For years, I was really into the affiliate marketing thing. And at some point it, it starts to build up because you're saying, oh, I can get a little bit of kickback from this. Well, why don't I get a kickback from this to other thing, which I recommend the service all the time. Why don't I get some kickback from that? And then it starts to build up where I don't know, that might not work, might not happen to you, but it happened to me that I started wanting to get kickback for everything. I started to say, Oh, I'm not going to share this unless that person has an affiliate, uh, you know, affiliate thing. And, uh, or, well, I'm not, well, I'm not going to publish the blog post yet. Cause I got to still get, join the affiliate program and, and get the affiliate link at, and then at some point I, I, I looked at myself and go, Oh my God, like I, I'm basically, um, I can't, it's like I'm stopping the flow of sharing because I'm so concerned about the lost opportunity cost of a potential, potentially big thing that what if, a, what if this blog post goes viral and I lose a thousand dollars because I didn't share an affiliate link in there. So the reality of it is that all of that is wasted energy that, that I realized over the years. That's why at one point in 2014, I said, Screw affiliate marketing. I'm not doing any more affiliate marketing. I'm just going to share from the heart. Use no affiliate links. I'm going to share what I really love and just, I'm, and I'm going to make money in a different way. So um, the reality about affiliate marketing, the people who are trying to make money with affiliate marketing, most of them aren't making anything. Or most of them, most of them make $50 a month and go, whoa, whoa, I'm a ridiculous. All that energy went into that and you made $50 a month or even $500 a month. It's not worth it. Not worth it. The real affiliate marketing money comes after you've built up an audience, right? So don't worry about affiliate links yet. You build up an audience first when you know that, okay, now I've got a thousand people paying attention to me. Now let's go work on affiliate deals. Now let's work with this business to sell something I believe in to my thousand people for whom this is right. I'm going to make lots of money doing that. But all up until then, and ironically, if you keep thinking about affiliate links as you build up your audience, you're going to build it up in an inauthentic way. Because you're always there subconsciously. You're like, I'm trying to make money from them. I'm trying to make money from them. Instead of I'm sharing from the heart, I'm sharing from the heart. Which energy is more powerful for building an audience? Okay. When it comes to free content, make it truly free, which means I'm not trying to make $3 from this blog post or even 50. I don't care. Okay. I'm building up an audience first. And then I'll go do the big affiliate deals or the medium size affiliate deals. Then it's worth it, right? Then it's worth it. Anyway, so I hope this helps. Um, okay. Oh, I lost Denise. I was hoping I could answer her question. 
Uh, Denise, if you're watching, you can come back. I'm definitely going to, uh, I'll save some time at the end to answer your question, but I wanted to kind of get over some of the, um, the more, uh, the questions that were kind of a, broadly applicable to everybody. And then, and then we'll, we'll go into more detailed questions. So Glorianne says, um, and thank you, Glorianne, for being willing to share your name uh, in, in the feedback and the question form. Some people say they suffer from imposter syndrome. I feel like I suffer from be everything for everyone syndrome. Yes, I can totally relate to that. A lot of us can. How do I cultivate a referral system with other coach, therapists, and such that's in line with my personal values and ethics? Are my standards too high? Am I blocking myself from creating a network of professionals that will ultimately free me from the being everyone for be everything and everyone syndrome? So, um, you know, given that you are here, if you want to unmute and say a bit more uh, about that, uh, that, that'd be great. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll answer more generally. Um, it's not a bad idea to to have a a strict vetting process um so so from what i'm hearing and let me know, let me know if this is correct the be everyone what what you mean is that well hi gloria hi <laughs> thanks for un unmuting so uh do you want to say that so so am i am i correct in thinking that you you have people who ask you about different things and so you want to refer them to people but you're not sure you can trust those people uh that's correct so um, what I'm, I'm a hypnotherapist and I use the same tool yes. for uh, lots of different things. Mm -hmm. However, um, I also know that my clients can benefit yes. um, from other people's expertise yes. that yeah. I cannot fill for them. And I, I, want, I, I don't know how to get the right people that you know, have the same kind of uh that heart-centered um relationship with their clients yes. that yes. are not you know just going to give them something without looking at each person individually totally um, well like that kind of thing so here's my here's my recommendation right um i don't have to type this out I'll just speak it chances are you find yourself needing to prefer a specific set of things um, like oh people well let me ask you you know of the things that you want to refer people to there's probably three types of providers or two types or whatever or four that that are like okay that's more most urgent for me because most people ask me about that that's something that I don't do isn't that true like there's yes right right yeah. so so essentially you really only need to vet those two or three types very personally um, maybe you could try their service or maybe you could, you know, have ask, ask people who have tried their service to give you genuine experiences. Uh, but I, I think that's, that's pretty much the, but in terms of even finding them, even discovering them, this is where, you know, if you join groups that are more heart centered groups, um, or, or ask around and I don't know if you've done this yet, like maybe go on Facebook and ask, Hey, I'm looking for you know, a, an acupuncturist or whatever. I'm just going to name, name one. Sure. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Looking for an acupuncturist who, who really um, is well reputed as, is, is ta really takes good care of their clients and, and whatever other characteristics that you want. And I bet people are going to, Oh my gosh, my, my acupuncturist is amazing. Or, you know, so, uh, and, and, and you, you know, yeah. So then you could kind of drill down to the people who seem really excited and someone whose opinion you trust. And kind of go from there okay thank you you're welcome okay so let me just see if um uh give me a moment here i'm going to see if denise happens to be watching uh on the um on the facebook live because if she is i'm going to get to her question uh next because she did submit the question in advance as well and um okay had to go. what's that i think denise had to go yeah uh, that's that's too bad. Okay, well, I she's in my uh, master art program, so I'm, I'll find a, I'll find another way to to um, respond. And thank you, Bing's, for for chatting in the Zoom uh, live, uh, the Facebook live. You see, this Zoom this Zoom meeting was not Zoom bombed. I mean, like most Zoom, I, I've had so many ninety nine point nine 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 percent of my Zoom meetings have not been Zoom bombed, right? Even though this is a public this is a public meeting, but as long as I don't share the Zoom link publicly. No one, all the trolls are like, oh my gosh, I wish I could get to that Zoom meeting. 
but I have so many numbers, I have to guess, right? No one's gonna guess it, so that's the reality of it. Um, okay, so let's keep going here. Um, Anonymous says, I feel like I'm creating a lot of free content on Instagram, and especially, and while I enjoy the creative aspect of it and getting positive feedback, I'm not seeing real results in terms of sales. I'm wondering if there's a better way to use my content creating energies. For example, put out a monthly newsletter or repost my Facebook and Instagram content on Facebook. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely a, a valid question. Um, you know, likely buyers, um, likely buyers in order, right? I, I would say, uh, I would say, well, first of all, previous buyers, <laughs> they're more, more, more likely. And then of course, um, current buyers, friends, right? And, and then, you know, emails, newsletter, subscriber. And then um, basically after that, I would probably say Facebook, Facebook uh, friends, Facebook fans, um, YouTube subscribers, um, and, then, and then everything else. That's what I found. That's what I found in terms of the order. And so we, we need to ask ourselves, well, how do, we, how do we then use our, spend our energies thoughtfully when we're trying to sell something? Well, let's look at this list. How do you reach previous buyers? Are they automatically added or with their permission added to an email subscriber list? You know, I automatically, I autom I automatically add uh, my, my buyers, my course buyers to my monthly uh, best content, you know, newsletter list. And I have basically gotten no complaints about this after having done this with many, 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 many people. Um, if you're in Europe, then you know follow follow GDPR, GD, GDPR rules, and uh, ask people before you before you add them. Um, so technically, even if you're not in Europe, you're supposed to you know take care of your European audience that way. Uh, I am an I'm a known GDPR rebel. I think GDPR was set up to uh, tackle the spammers and the privacy concerns from big companies like Google, they were not meant to hold us back as solopreneurs. Um, so that's, that's why I'm a GDPR rebel. I don't follow GDPR rules. Um, I'm out in saying that. Um, I, I will be, just like I'm the first to be Zoom bombed, let me be the first to get fined by GDPR, which is ridiculous. It's not, the GDPR has been fined, has fined so few people that it's, there's literally a Wikipedia entry for the organizations that GDPR has fined. Like you literally can see, it, 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 and with the millions, tens, hundreds of millions of you know, businesses around the world, GDPR has fined these lists. It's like, come on. It's meant for the bigger spammers and people who are really you know, grossly incompetent. Like, oh, they leaked out the personal phone numbers and email addresses of their clients or whatever. It's grossly things like that. But when it's just, People joining your email list? Yeah, come on. Okay, so that's my, that's my GDPR rebel. Um, so current buyer's friends, are you asking your current clients, current students to share this? You know, that's, that's a question, right? Email newsletters, are you sending it to email newsletters? Are you posting it on your Facebook profile? Are you putting it on your Facebook business page with ads so that it actually reaches your Facebook business page fans and engagers? Are you, did you make a YouTube video explaining why people should buy that thing? And then everywhere else, you might as well post if you have uh, those things. But basically, um, yeah, I, I, to, to Anonymous, this is my recommendation for how you really spend your marketing energies when you're trying to sell something. Uh, in terms of content, uh, you know, this is really where content begins, right? So are you, yes, are you sending email newsletter content? Are you posting it on your Facebook profile? Are you doing it on your Facebook business page with ads so you reach more people? Are you making YouTube videos, et cetera, et cetera? So anyway, I hope that helps. And um, at this point, let me see here. Is there anybody here who submitted a question, uh, especially in advance? And we have about 10 minutes left, so I, I wanna just, uh, answer let me see if i um or just anybody who has a question that we, you want to discuss here um, um george yes would you recommend a facebook fan page as a a 
the easiest place to begin blogging? Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, well, okay, so let me, let me go to, um, yeah, so let's see here. Yeah, let's talk about this. Where to begin blogging, okay. So where, where to begin blogging, um, you know, there's, there's two considerations here. One is where are you comfortable posting them? Okay, and the second question is where will you reach the right people? Okay, so, so um, in terms of comfortable or, you know, or have, uh, you know, comfortable posting them, hopefully you're, you're comfortable sharing it everywhere, um, every, you know, online. And um, so then, you know, if, but if you're, if you're not so comfortable, like you're just getting going with writing, share it with supportive friends first to get the muscle of getting good feedback, right? Supportive feedback. Uh, so, so it gives courage um, to post more publicly. So that's, 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 you know, that's one question that might be relevant to some of you. So where will you reach the right people is really the, the you know, the other question that's that I think is important, and this is where um, you know Facebook ads makes that easy. Okay, Facebook profile posts might might be relevant. You know, if many FB friends, you know, are people you want to reach. Okay, um, makes it easy to reach any uh, people of any interest demographic. Etc. So, so I, I would say Facebook ads. You know, in, in other words, Facebook text-only posts on your on your business uh, FB business page. That would be my recommendation. Okay, um, and then beyond that, it's really uh, to reach more more of the right people. It's guest blogging you know, places, uh, other blogs that have the audience you want. Um, want. Uh, uh, they are willing for you for you to write an article there if they're your friends <laughs> or or they have so much con uh, consistent content they can't create it themselves and frequently use guest to write okay or you are an expert right on your topic that's interesting for for their audience and they're not right so that, th those are the reasons i think why people would say yes to oh sure don i have you know write for my guest blog you know write for my blog etc and then finally seo uh, seo meaning i.e to have your blog found on google etc okay and for seo i would recommend write on medium.com and get good at keyword research. Okay. Also, also research how to get into medium publications or to get curated, to get curated on medium. Okay. So if you if you research those those things, keyword research and and, and how to get curated on medium, uh, that would be my my best recommendation for for SEO, basically. That's the simplest way. You could, you could of course, post it on your own uh, website um, and try to SEO your website. But what I've learned from just, you know, my, at least my own experimentation is that the, um, the SEO by medium.com is, you know, light years ahead of the SEO from our own website. They have an entire team for SEO. We are ourselves trying to figure SEO out. So, Every time I, I put blogs on my website at a medium, the medium one always wins Google. Um, you know, and I've tried both. I've tried like, okay, but then post it on my website first. And then I'll, send, I'll syndicate it over to medium with a canonical link. Those of you who don't know what that means, or those who do know what that means, knows why that's important. Uh, let, me, let me try to get Google to prioritize my website. Okay, I tried that for a while. And then I tried, okay, let me get Google to prioritize my articles on medium.com. And then I'll put it off to my website later. The medium ones always go way, way higher uh, than the ones on, on, on. So I hope this is helpful. And uh, any other questions?
Okay, and I'm gonna try to answer, while I'm waiting, I'm gonna try to answer some questions from those who were, uh, who tried to attend this morning's call and I uh, couldn't answer the questions there. Um, okay, so Matea says, I'm a certified health coach, lifestyle coach. For years, what's kept me forward is trying to pinpoint being indecisive about pinpointing my niche. I feel this is where I need to stand out in the crowd, but it keeps me stuck. Now I've arrived at a phase in my life, building a solid income of utmost importance. This adds some anxiety and, and stress. My, my dream is to run a business mostly from home around the kids' schedules. Yeah, it'd be awesome. Any advice how to start? Yes. And this, this is pointing, me back, pointing you all back to my article on first steps, you know, first steps to starting a solopreneur service-based business. You can Google that. And I, I, I think if you Google that, yep, <laughs> there it is. There's my article, right? Obviously, that's a very specific search result, <laughs> but uh, search, search term. But anyway, so that's, uh, Matea, that's what I would recommend starting with. Use this article and then ask me more going forward. The other thing, the other article I want you to, um, to look up from me is an article I wrote uh, not too long ago about, um, let's see here, blah, 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 building trust. Uh, where was it? Where was it? Where was it? Um, da, da, da. It was about, oh yeah, there it is. So I'll, I'll, I'll get the friend link there as well. Um, itching, question mark. Okay, so um, yeah, and I'm gonna send this to, to Matea later. So it's basically this article called, I, I struggle with describing what I do, being a multi-potentialite, multi-passionate business. Ah, I have so many things I could do. It's hard for me to narrow it down to one thing. Well, guess what? Maybe you don't have to. And it's true, I'm not saying that as a, clever thing to say, but truly, I, I don't think you have to. So that's my article about that. You can read that and ask me anything from there. Um, oh, we talked about this that this morning before we got Zoom bombed. Um, let's see here. For me, as a mentor coach wanting to expand my online presence, but with very limited with screen time due to migraines, sorry to hear that, not having a large budget, how would you recommend prioritizing? So I would say videos. So, so mentor coach, means that you really want people who feel very comfortable with working with you, with your voice, with your way of speaking, right? I'm assuming you, you coach mentor them through Zoom, through, you know, like a video conference, or at least through the phone. So if you're able to do video, if you're not too shy to do video, if, you're, if, it's not, if it doesn't cause you migraines or whatever, then do video, put it on YouTube, put it on Facebook using ads to, to, to send it out to people. Um, that's my recommendation. And then writing, of course, writing uh, doesn't have to be long. Um, you know, it can, it can be 300 words, can be effective. Okay, it doesn't have to be long. And then Facebook ads on, on, on to distribute these things to the right people, right? And then, and then collaborations with other people who have your ideal audience. So I wanna ask this person here, right? Who is your ideal client or what you imagine to be your ideal client, if you don't know who they are, what you imagine to be, and who and where do they find information? Where do, what kind of blogs do they read? What kind of newsletters do they subscribe to? You know, what blogs do they read? What newsletters, right? Which websites do they visit, right? Which thought leaders do they follow, et cetera, et cetera. Can you collaborate with those blogs, newsletters, websites, thought leaders, you know, you don't, you don't start with the most famous ones. You start with people who are, you know, more reachable, right? Collaborate with them, meaning can you, do a, can you do a webinar for their audience? Could you interview them and they interview you, that, you know, the, the thought leader, that blog or that website? So anyway, that's my recommendation. Um, I'm marketing my first book. It's on Amazon, Google Play, Smashbooks, and my website. What are the steps do you recommend for promotion? Create a book club or webinar series about your book and highlight specific chapters. Uh, in that series. Like, all right, today we're gonna go over chapter two, which is about blah, 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 blah. Let's, let, let, let's talk it through. Why is this important? And what are some steps you can take? And what, you know, really focus more, focus more on the why that topic is important, how that issue shows up in people's lives, right? Um, and how, um, uh, how they, can, they can start to, get, you know, get going on solving that issue or get, you know, get going on that goal, right? So 
Okay, Mel, thank you, Mel, for your question here. How do you make the decision of choosing a date and time when it comes to your workshops? I struggle with this. I find it challenging to find the right date and time for my clients. I've tried surveys. I don't get enough responses to make a sound decision. Summer is even more difficult, seeing that most people like to be outside. Okay, great. Yeah, great question. Of course, I've thought a lot about this, given that I have so many online workshops, et cetera. So here's my answer to that. First of all, my question, Mel, is what are the best times of the day for you to be delivering workshops? This is really important because if you show up at the best times of your day, the workshops tend to be the highest quality, which means the word of mouth tends to be better, which means you have a larger pool of people to survey, to come to your workshop, et cetera. So that's really the most important thing, okay? Really, okay. Now, if, if it turns out that the best time of your day is, let's say you're in Americas, right? Um, and, and the best time of your day is like, you're, you're a night owl. You're you like 10 p.m. You're like, yay, right? Then guess what? Then your market is Australia, New Zealand, all of Asia, plenty of, plenty of market there. You could use Facebook ads to reach Australian, New Zealanders, uh, Singaporeans. Singapore is a mainly English-speaking country, high-income English-speaking country. You know? so, and uh, uh, where else in Asia? You know, uh, Japan, Korea, Taiwan. You know, focus on English-speaking people there, using Facebook ads to reach the English speakers of these countries. Right. So that, that's an extreme example. But chances are maybe your best time is in the morning or, you know, you know, I don't know, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. is still doable for, for people. You know. So that's my recommendation. Now, yeah, Jeffrey here on Zoom is in Japan. So, yeah, certainly there are lots of people who are English speaking are there. So um, uh, let's say that you're like, well, George, but my market, let's say, you know, I don't know about Mel, but let's say Mel's is, 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 you know, saying, well, my market is North America. So I have to choose a time that is really best for them. Then, then, then here's, oh, two time, op, two time options if it's various time zones. I, I find it helpful to do 9 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Pacific. Okay, those are, those are the two that, I, that basically reach the most number of people in the world and still fit within my work hours. Basically, this is a 6 p.m. Pacific time. After this, I'm checking email real quick and I'm going to dinner. That's it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the end of my day, right? But... Um, but the other thing, if, if you're just going to pick one time, Mel, so, so, so you might actually try different time options, even if it's not different time zones, just to see. So like when I first started teaching online workshops, online courses, I would do every session two times, two different times. And I would just observe how many people attended each session. And that taught me a lot. And I, what I've learned is that for my market and probably for many of your markets, okay, the 9 a.m. Pacific gets way more attendance than the 6 p.m. Pacific. Um, I, I used to do the 9, 9 a.m. 3 p.m. Pacific, and 3 p.m. gets better attendance than 6 p.m. So the later it goes, the harder it is for me to get people to attend. But now that my audience is larger, and I do want to meet the Australians where they're at, the New Zealanders, the Asians, then and and the and not just that, but also the people in North in the Americas who want to watch this at night when they're making dinner after work you know before they they go to bed because i i sue them and make them go to sleep <laughs> so so yeah so that's that's my recommendation is um yeah so yeah jeffrey says yeah 6 p.m pacific is 10 a.m over there in japan so it's, it's great great timing for a lot of people and yeah just test time so that's my recommendation um okay so yeah, I think I think that's all. Um, I, I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer this one as well. Uh, Sharon um, was very patient this morning. She was there at, for that terrible experience, so I definitely want to answer her question before we go. By the way, it is already past the hour, so if you have a meeting to go to, you might want to go <laughs> go to the meeting. Thank you for being here, even afterwards. I'll go for another couple minutes if you want to stay. Otherwise, it's all recorded anyway. So using Facebook to build an audience, Sharon. And by the way, all the names that I share they put the, the full names knowing that it's going to be public. So um, I've been posting five times per week on my business page and it's related group that includes two to three offers per month offers, meaning, Hey, everyone check out this online course, check out my services or whatever. I have 313 people who've liked my page and I'm only reaching 15 to 20 people per post. Okay. Is that, is that usual? That seems low. Uh, she says, 
Um, she says, that seems low. Of those, usually zero to two people like the post, but no one engages with it any further, even when I post things that are current and I'm asking for interaction. I'm spending about a dollar a day on boosting my most engaged posts, and only 25 to 30 new people per month are liking those boosted posts. That also seems very low to me. I've also specified that I only want registered nurses and about half the people who like my post are not in that audience. How can I get better results? Okay, there's a bunch of questions here. First of all, I wanna make sure, Sharon, that make sure your ad audience, okay, in the detailed targeting section, just, just below, okay, I should say, just below the detailed targeting, you know, edit, edit your audience, and look just below the detail targeting section and make sure uh, there's no box checked that says audience expansion. Okay, so for most of us, well, for, for most, some of us, uh, we don't have to worry about that because that box is even, isn't even there. But for some uh, people who are kind of just, I don't, I don't, I, I think it's for people who don't have a large enough audience yet maybe, or they're getting started with Facebook ads or something. Facebook kind of ex assumes you want audience expansion, which is a bad idea for you. It's a good deal for Facebook because Facebook, that means Facebook will get you more results, quote unquote, but the results are not the results you want. It's not the people you want. So you make sure to uncheck audience expansion uh, so that you're reaching just the registered nurses, okay? Not people who are similar like registered nurses, no. Okay, just that. The second thing is um, you're wondering about your organic reach. You have 313 people. Each time you're reaching 15 to 25 people. So let's look at that. 15 divided by 313 is 4.7, 4.8%. And 25 divided by 313 is 8, about 8%. So you're reaching between, you know, so, so you're reaching, so you're reaching between uh, 4 to 8% organically. Okay, on your biz page. Okay, let's let's take a look at mine. How many am I reaching? Okay, so um, let's take a look here. All right. Okay, so first of all, my I have uh, I have six thousand and six hundred six thousand six hundred. Okay, six thousand six. This is just the people who are um, uh, recent one week period. Only five thousand of my fans were online, so the other thousand weren't online kind of thing so uh so so look at mine all right um let's look at uh let's look at this one or no let, let's look at the typical ones right so how many am i reaching let's, let's take a look engagement rate okay look at my engagement rate sharon i'm down to the five percent sometimes six percent twelve percent fifteen percent five percent seven eight so yes it's I mean, I would like to see sometimes that you get into the 12, 15% range like I do. Whoops, where is it? Where did it go? Okay, this one. Sometimes I get into the 15% range. Sometimes, you know, with, with really viral posts, posts that are like people want to say something about, like my Zoom bombing experience, that gets a 19%, right? But, you know, a lot of posts get 5% or 6%. And that's fine, right? That's fine. So that's fine. Um, zero to two people... Two, two people like the post. No one engages any further, even when I post things that are current and asking for interaction. Okay, so it really helps to have a few true fans following, uh, commenting on your content. Okay, even one thoughtful comment or at least positive comment, other, you know, more than one word no like amen doesn't count okay <laughs> or thank you doesn't doesn't <laughs> won't, won't won't have this effect but but even thoughtful or at least positive comment more than one word will get a lot more comments on that post because people are given permission you know people need to feel safe and be given permission that someone like them is commenting Okay, and so if you are only using Facebook ads and you, you, you haven't gotten your own friends who are, you know, Sharon's trying to reach nurses, what about your friends who are nurses, right? Get your friends slash supporters who are the type you want to reach, you know, type of person you want to reach to comment on your FB posts, 
Okay, so how, well, how do you get them to do that? Okay, um, you might, you know, this is not my favorite strategy, I should say, but you might trade with a few friends, you know, trade with, with two friends to say, um, I'll, comment, uh, I'll comment on your FB post ASAP and, um, and you can try to do, right, to do, to do, to do the same for me. Okay, so, so that's, that's not my favorite strategy. I'll, I'll put this down a little bit. But whenever you've made a FB post, before you boost it, email to your subscribers the link to that post to have them comment on it. You see what I mean? So, so let, me, let me show you how to get the link to a post. Uh, those of you who, who don't know, to get the link to a Facebook post to email it out in, in your newsletter, you find the Facebook post Okay, you find whatever the post is, whether it's a video or a post, same thing. There will be a timestamp. If you click on the timestamp, it will bring you to an exact link um, that you can copy and paste into your newsletter. Now, you don't need anything after the question mark, uh, gobbledygook. There's a lot of weird code that Facebook puts in to the, you know, look at, look at that long link, right? You, all you need is the link that 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 ends with the question mark the the slash question mark you just need everything before the question mark that's all you need before the question mark a long string of weird stuff that's all you need okay so um let's see here yeah um oh yeah and ida has a good idea here yeah sharon uh, she wrote sharon can also respond to her own posts as her profile and respond to everyone who makes a comment on a timely basis yeah absolutely that's a good idea ida thank you ida ida wrote um, uh, comment on your own business page post as your profile. Now, the only thing that I don't love about this is that it might look like uh, Sharon is kind of gaming the system a little bit. But but if you write right, comment on your Facebook as your profile, or or simply as your page, it's okay to do it as your own page and say and maybe and maybe you have one more thing to add or say. I'm looking forward to your answer, right, to this question, blah, 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 and um, make it an easy question <laughs> to answer, right? So that, that tends to help. And Ida also wrote, uh, reply, re uh, whoops, reply to each comment as timely as you can. And that, that builds a relationship with those commenters that make them more likely to continue to um, comment in the future, all right? So with that, I'm gonna let you all go. Thank you for staying uh, over time um, and I appreciate your presence here. You all are a way more uh, enjoyable group <laughs> than not even comparison, but thank you for being here and thank you for being in support, especially since I had a tough morning. Uh, just seeing your faces and seeing your chats is a uh, really, um, yeah, it's a, it's a bomb. It's a healing bomb, so thank you. Not a Zoom bomb, but a healing bomb. <laughs> okay. All right, everyone. Have a great rest of your night and day. Thank you again. And uh, I'll see you around. Okay. Bye for now.